By this point in the biology playlist, you're probably wondering a very natural question. How is gender determined in an organism? And it's not an obvious answer, because throughout the animal kingdom, it's actually determined in different ways. In some creatures, especially some types of reptiles, reptiles, it's environmental. Environmental, not all reptiles, but certain cases of it. It could be the the maybe the the temperature in which the the embryo develops will dictate whether it turns into a male or a female, or other environmental factors. And in other uh, types of animals, especially mammals, of which we are uh, one uh, example, it's genetic basis. It's a genetic basis. So, so your your next question is, hey Sal. So let me write this down. In mammals. In mammals. It's genetic. It's genetic. So you're like, hey, maybe there's a maybe there are different alleles, a male or a female allele. But then you're like, hey, but you know, there's so many different characteristics that make uh, that that differentiate a man from a woman. Uh, maybe it would have to be a whole set of genes that have to work together. And to some degree, your second answer would be more correct. So let me just draw a a. It's not even more than just a set of genes. It's actually whole chromosomes determine it. So let me draw a nucleus. Uh, that's going to be my nucleus. And this is going to be the nucleus for a man. So 22 of the pairs of chromosomes are just regular non-sex determining chromosomes. So I could just do, you know, that's one of the homologous 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. I could just keep going. And you have, and you eventually you have 22 pairs. So these 22 pairs right there, they're called autosomal. And those are just our standard pairs of chromosomes that code for different things. Each of these right here is a homologous pair, homologous, which we learned before. You get one from each of your parents. They don't necessarily code for the same thing, for the same versions of the genes, but they code for the same genes. If eye color is on this gene, it's also on that gene. And the other gene, the homologous pair, you might have different versions of eye color on either one. That determines what you display. But these are just kind of the, the standard uh, genes that have nothing to do with our gender. And then you have these two other special, special chromosomes. I'll do this one. It'll be a long brown one. And then I'll do a short blue one. And the first thing you'll notice is that they're, they don't look homologous. How could they code for the same thing when the blue one's short and the brown one's long? And that's true. They aren't homologous. And these we'll call our sex-determining chromosomes. Sex-determining chromosomes. Chromosomes. And the long one right here, it's been the convention, is to call that the X chromosome. Let me scroll down a little bit. And the blue one right there for that as the Y chromosome. And to figure out whether something is a male or a female, it's a pretty simple system. If you got a Y chromosome, you are a male. So let me write that down. So this what this nucleus that I drew just here, obviously you could have the whole broader cell all around here. This is the nucleus for a man. So if you have an X chromosome, and I'll we'll talk about in a second why you can only get that from your mom, an X chromosome from your mom, and a Y chromosome from your dad, this you will be a male. If you get an X chromosome from your mom and an X chromosome from your dad, you're going to be a female. And so we could actually even draw a Punnett square. There's almost a trivially easy Punnett square, but it kind of shows what all of the different possibilities are. So let's say these are your mo this is your mom's genotype for her sex-determining chromosome. She's got two X's. That's what makes her your mom and not your dad. And then your dad has an X and a Y and a Y chromosome. I should do a capital. And has a Y chromosome. We could do a Punnett square. What are all the different combinations of offspring? Well, your mom could give this X chromosome, and in conjunction with this X chromosome from your dad, this would produce a female. Your mom could give this other X chromosome with that X chromosome. That would be a female as well. Or, well, your mom's always going to be donating an X chromosome. And then your, your dad is going to donate either the X or the Y. So in this case, it'll be the Y chromosome. So these would be female, and those would be male. And it works out nicely that half are female and half are male. But a, a, a very interesting and uh, a somewhat ironic uh, fact might pop out of you when you see this. 
what determines whether someone is, or who determines whether someone is, ma whether their offspring are male or female? Is it the mom or the dad? Well, the mom always donates an X chromosome. So in no way does the mom, uh, what, what the, the, the haploid uh, genetic makeup of the mom's egg, of, of the gamete from the female, in no way does that determine the gender of the offspring. It's all determined by whether, you know, let's say these are all of, let me just draw a bunch of, you know, dad's got a lot of sperm, and they're all racing towards the egg, and some of them have an X chromosome in them, and some of them have a Y chromosome in them. And obviously they have others. And obviously the one, if, if this guy up here wins the race, or maybe I should say this girl, if she wins the race, then the fertilized egg will develop into a female. If this sperm wins the race, then the fertilized egg will develop into a male. So the and the reason why I said it's ironic is throughout history, and probably the most famous example of this is, is Henry VIII. Henry the Eighth, you have these. I mean, it's not just the case with kings. It's probably true uh, because most of of our civilization is male dominated. That you've had these men who are obsessed with producing a male heir to kind of take over the family name, and you know, in the case of Henry the Eighth, take over a country, and they become very disappointed, and they, and they they tend to blame their wives when the wives keep producing females. But it's all their fault. Henry VIII, I mean, the most famous case was with Anne Boleyn. He, he, you know, she's some, I, you know, I, I'm not an expert here, but the, the, the general notion is that, look, she, he, she became upset with her that she wasn't producing a male heir, and then he found a, a, a reason to get her uh, essentially decapitated, even though, even though it was all his fault, his fault. His, the, he was maybe producing a lot more sperm that looked like that than was looking like this. He eventually does produce a male heir, so he was, and if we assume that it was his child, then, uh, then obviously he was producing some of these, but for the most part, it was all Henry VIII's fault. So that's why I say there's a little bit of irony here, is that the people uh, doing the blame are the people to blame for the lack of a male heir. Now, uh, one question that might immediately uh, pop up in your head is, Sal, is everything on these chromosomes related to just our, you know, maybe sex determining traits, or are there other stuff on them? So let me draw some chromosomes. So let's say that's an X chromosome, and this is a Y chromosome. Now the X chromosome it does code for a lot of, uh, more things, although it, it it is kind of famously gene poor. It has it codes for on the order of 1,500 genes. And the Y chromosome is pretty, I mean, it's, it's the most gene poor of all the chromosomes. It only co codes for on the order of 78 genes. I just looked this up, but you know, who knows if it's exactly 78. But what it tells you is it, it does very little other than determining what the gender is. And the way it determines that, it does have one gene on it called the SRY gene. You don't have to, you don't have to know that. SRY, that plays a role in the development development of testes or the main the main the 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 male sexual organ so if you have this around this gene right here can start coding for things that will eventually lead to the development of the testicles and if you don't have that around that won't happen so you'll end up with a female and i'm i'm making gross oversimplifications here but the other everything i've dealt with so far is this is okay this is clearly plays a role in determining sex. But you do have other traits on these genes. For example, and the, the famous cases all deal with uh, specific disorders. So for example, color blindness, the genes or the mutations, I, could, I should say. So the mutations, the mutations that cause color blindness, color red-green color blindness, blindness, which I did in green, which is maybe a little bit uh, uh, maybe inappropriate color blindness and also hemophilia. Hemophilia. This is an inability of your blood to clot. It's actually, there's several types of hemophilia, but hemophilia is a, an inability for your blood to clot properly. And both of these are mutations on the X chromosome. Mutations on the X chromosome. And they're recessive mutations. They're recessive. So what does that mean? It means both of your X chromosomes have to have, let's take the case for hemophilia, 
both of your X chromosomes have to have the hemophilia mutation in order for you to show the phenotype of having hemophilia. So for example, if there's a woman, and let's say this is her genotype. She has one regular X chromosome, and then she has one X chromosome that has the, I'll put a little superscript there for hemophilia. She has the hemophilia uh, a mutation. She's just going to be a carrier. Her phenotype right here, her phenotype is going to be no, no hemophilia. No hemophilia. She'll have no problem clotting her blood. The only way that a woman could be a hemophiliac is if she gets two versions of this, because this is a recessive mutation. Two versions. Now this, this individual will be, will have hemophilia. Now men, they only have one X chromosome. They only have one X chromosome. So for a man to exhibit hemophilia, to have this phenotype, he just needs it only on the one X chromosome he has. So, and then the other one's a Y chromosome. So a man will have, so this man will have hemophilia. So a natural question should be arising is, hey, you know, this guy, let's just say that this is a relatively infrequent mutation that arises on X chromosome. The question is, who's more likely to have hemophilia, a male or a female? All else equal, who's more likely to have it? Well, if this is a relatively infrequent allele, a female, in order to display it, has to get two versions of it. So if the frequency of it, let's say that the frequency of it, and I'll, you know, I looked it up before this video, roughly, they say, between 1 in 5 to 10,000 men exhibit hemophilia. So let's say that the allele frequency of this is 1 in 7,000. Is, is the frequency of XH, right? the hemophilia version of the X chromosome. And that's why 1 in, one in 7,000 men display it, because it's completely determined whether you know, there's a 1 in 7,000 chance that this X chromosome they get is the hemophilia version. Who cares what the Y chromosome they get is? Because that essentially doesn't code at all for the, the blood clotting factors and all of the things that drive hemophilia. Now, for a woman to get hemophilia, what has to happen? She has to have two X chromosomes with the mutation. Well, the probability of, of each of them having the mutation is 1 in 7,000. So the probability of her having hemophilia is, is 1 in 7,000 times 1 in 7,000. Or that's 1 in, what, 49 million. So as you could imagine, the, the incidence of hemophilia in women is, a, is much lower than the incidence of hemophilia in men. And in general, for any sex link trait, if it's recessive, it's a, if it's a recessive sex link trait, which means you either, men will, if they have it, they're going to show it because they don't have another X chromosome to dominate it. Or for a woman to show it, she's have to have both versions of it. The incidence in men is going to be, is going to be uh, I guess we could say it's, so let's say, the, let's say that P is, or let me write M is the incidence in men. In incidence, and I'm spelling badly, incidence in men, then the incidence in women will be what? You could view this as the allele frequency of that mutation on the X chromosome. So women have to get two versions of it. So the woman's frequency is m squared. And you might say, hey, that looks like a bigger number. I'm squaring it. But you have to remember that these numbers the frequency is less than 1. So in the case of hemophilia, that was 1 in 7,000. So if you square 1 in 7,000, you get 1 in 49 million. Anyway, hopefully you found that interesting. And now you know uh, what, how we all become m men and women. And, and even better, you know whom to blame uh, when, when, when uh, some of these, uh, uh, I guess, male-focused uh, parents uh, uh, are having trouble getting their son.